Darian, it's so excited to have you on the Business Owner Spotlight interview series and excited to learn more about what's been going on for you and your business and what you're up to these days. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Awesome. I am the founder of Dash Activate Online. It's an e-commerce marketing agency. We specialize in Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Google now. There's a lot of channels that we're working across. Uh, not just the media buying strategy, but we also do the creative and also helping brand owners kind of get out of their day-to-day -day where if they're selling a product, usually they're very focused on what that product means to them. We help them sort of look through the other side of the window and think about what does that mean to the consumer and then how do we actually sell that to somebody? So uh, that's kind of where our secret source is. Oh, that's awesome. And I was actually checking out your website and the flow of it and how well you communicate the results you've gotten for your clients. I was like, wow, this is awesome. So I'll make sure I share Amazing. that and all the information so other people can see your site too and learn more. But how long have you been actually at this and in the space you are now? Maybe you've been in it even before you started your business. Tell me a little bit about that journey and story. Yeah, of course. So I actually started... Well, my, it took me forever to graduate university because I just partied way too much and thought that I was going to do that for the rest of my life, but got a bit older and wiser and ended up completing a marketing degree. Started actually working for an American company in Melbourne, Australia, doing, well, actually, no, before that, I started a uh, media buying side. So I was at OMD, mm. a media buying agency, doing print and TV placements and buying media for brands. There wasn't a lot of money on that side. So then I jumped to the sales side, working for an American company uh, based out of LA and doing kind of content integrations. We were one of the first companies to start doing like web series for brands mm -hmm. as well. So we partnered with Disney and Ford and Heinz. I don't even know if they're, yeah, Heinz in the US. Um, yeah. With those brands and kind of getting mummy bloggers in and creating kind of recipe content and video content. This is yeah, cool. like 12 plus years ago. As the landscape shifted to more social media, um, we ended up doing a lot of those content series on Facebook. And then I started working with a few different e-commerce stores just on the side. And then I quickly realized like, why am I working for this company when like, this is the only time in the history where the gap between the experts and uh, like the, the novices in social media is gonna be the smallest. Let me just go and start my own thing. And so that's when I started Dash Acting cool. Online purely around yeah, e-commerce and kind of taking the stuff that I learned around creating content and getting influencers and, and mummy bloggers involved and turning that into social ads and really getting on the forefront of the UGC trend. Very cool. That's awesome. And, and so as you kind of look at where we've been and where we're going, tell me a little bit about like the trends you've seen over kind of the last three or five years to where you're now seeing it going next. Of course. Yeah. Well, even it's a good uh, like case study, I think, because the stuff that we were doing with the web series is very overly produced, high production value. It was all about kind of imitating TV, but online. That was really the focus when everything sort of started because I guess everyone's mental models were like, oh, advertorial, TV placements, TV spots. And so that just naturally bled into the industry there. Hmm. Fast forward to now though, the way that TikTok and Instagram reels have changed, the, even the way people consume content, yeah. it probably all started with Vine and the six second videos. And oh, I remember that. Over yeah, like yeah. the last seven years, it's kind of gradually evolved into what it is now. It's, it's a lot more about being relatable and, or aspirational. And so you'll see, especially talking about TikTok, it, it really is about like providing value in, in those videos and those exchanges where people aren't watching that just to, to like see a brand or to, to see a joke. It's, is there something of value in this for them to improve their lives or to save money somewhere or help their, their loved ones? Like that's kind of the undertone of a lot of that content. That's what we really leverage now in our social media creatives because everything's got to start out with some sort of hook that's providing value, either solving a problem for someone or showing that you understand what their problem is better than another brand. Uh, that's really where the, the crux of it is. Very cool. And, and how are you seeing, is that a, is there a next evolution that you can kind of see coming or do you see this kind of continuing for some time? Like, tell me more about what you're seeing. Yeah, definitely. I think it, it's evolving in terms of getting shorter, uh, like content's getting shorter, the value bombs have got to be hitting faster. Um, the way that we're kind of communicating, a lot of the stuff is is almost, how about to explain it, but it's like two dimensions in the, the video. Oh. It's like, uh, like not just talking about the problem, but also showing the problem and what that means to that end, that end mm. person as quickly as possible. So it's not just about talking about the toilet being dirty. We want to actually show like a clogged toilet and someone frustrated about it 
and like water spilling out onto the floor. Like we really want to make people emotionally feel what that problem is, not just like seven years ago, it would have been a like a mum blogger being like, oh, I hate it when my kids block the toilet. Like, let me show you what this does. And like that, even that five second intro, you're going to lose 90% of the people yeah. going straight to the toilet, straight to the problem. So uh, that's, wow. I think, the way that it's going. And it's just going exponentially faster into like those value hits. Very cool. So a lot, what I'm hearing you say is like getting to the point faster, um, hitting emotion and showing more visual representation versus just verbal is. Yeah. And really saying. isolating the problem that that business is solving for that end consumer, because uh, at the end of the day, like everyone cares about themselves. So if you can show them like how this is going to make their lives better or how this is going to improve their lives of the loved ones, that's a lot easier for people to grasp onto. And they're, they're weirdly being trained to look for that sort of content through the way the algorithms are working and the videos that are being propped up organically. So we're Very just, cool. we're trying not to fight those algorithms. We're trying to play in, in what they're kind of guiding us towards. Yeah, we, exactly what you're saying, we reference as like the famous radio station that everyone loves to tune into, WIIFM, which just stands for what's in it for me. That's what we're yeah. always asking. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, exactly. why do I care? And you're right. The more you can just swipe, the faster you have to get to that point. So yeah. you don't have long and to get to it. You think about the way people are browsing their social feeds. Uh, this is probably one of the hardest things for brand owners to get their heads around because they they think, oh, I've got to go and make some videos and I've got to go and produce all these lovely images. And so they're so invested in the entire 45 seconds of that video yeah. or the entire kind of campaign shoot that they're doing. As people are browsing the feed, though, there's really only a couple of points on that ad that they're looking at to drive that first action, which is the headlines, first couple of lines in the copy, what's on that thumbnail What's the actual call to action there? Wow. It kind of now it simplifies it a little bit because we can just focus on those first levers to really test out like what's driving that scroll stopping power. Cool. And then we use that to dictate what the rest of the script needs to be as opposed to kind of doing it the other way. So cool. um, yeah. That's awesome. So just using the knowledge of what you're seeing and paying attention to that. I was going to ask you, which might connect to that of like, is content being is easier to, to be created based on what you're saying? Or is this more complicated? Or is it just the way you see it and how you adapt really? Yeah, I think for us, uh, it's getting easier because because we run so much content, we've got a lot of data on the types of we call them like recipes or vehicles. Yeah. So it might be something that's like, some of those training right now is like point of view. I've just replaced my toilet freshener with this thing or point of view. I've just upgraded my shirts to these new t-shirts. And it's really like cooking into that value bomb kind of idea. Yeah. That's the type of thing that I think we, yeah, we, we can scale that because we're working with so many brands and we just see, oh, this new idea we tested with this brand didn't really work that well. Mm. This vehicle was working really great. Okay. Let's try it over here with this other brand. Oh, it's working really great there. Cool. Now we've got some virality to it. We can start applying that to other brands. Yeah. And then it gives us more of a shopping list to kind of work through because we've, we've always got kind of trending vehicles that we know that we can go into. So yeah. when we bring on new brands, we've, we've already got a starting point. So it's, it's a little easier for us. For a brand just starting out, it's learning the space and trying to figure it out. It's probably a little bit harder because now you've got infinite choices of everything. Like where do you start yeah. when you can do anything? Yeah. And it also just proves why there's a huge value in hiring a company like yours versus exactly. trying to pay to figure all that out. It's well worth the investment to just come in and have someone who already has proven it off of someone else's money and campaign and exactly. can that knowledge over to you. Yeah. That makes yeah. complete sense. Um, very cool. So like in today's day, maybe it wasn't the same in the past when you were doing other things, but who's like an ideal customer now? Like what are the kind of brands or the, or maybe just the company characteristics that really make a good fit for you guys? Yeah. I've found for us, we've gotten very, very clear on like our ideal customer profile in the yeah. recent years. It's e-commerce stores that have a purpose-driven product. It can't be like a print on demand t-shirt that just has a random print on it because it's really hard to connect that to problems. But if you're out there actually solving a pain point for someone and have a purpose to that product and you're stuck at that kind of 20 to 30K mark, that tends to be the best spot for us because businesses that are in that revenue range, it's usually the founder probably running the ads or a freelancer running the ads. To actually optimize all of that creative, it is quite a scientific process where you want to be testing different hooks and different pain points and different messaging points. To run all of that unemotionally it's hard to do because you kind of need to run it through a spreadsheet and have ID numbers for things. And the business owners or people that are working in the company at that point are usually so attached to that 
brand story and what they mm. what they think of the brand it's hard for them to to break out of those molds and think oh what if i just show again going back to the, the dirty toilet example like what if i just show that and they're not even thinking in those kind of uh like lane ways yeah that tends to be the best for us because they yeah they've obviously got some ads that are running they've got some assets they've been developing they're starting to see some success but to get to that next level it's it's kind of like 20 times the amount of work to double the revenue they're not going to have the capacity to do that. So they, they need someone with a team. Um, and that's okay. where we come in. That makes total sense. And and when you said 30 to 40, is that revenue or is it an ad budget? Like, how do you know they're in the range that makes sense for you to maximize them? Because they've gotten it to a certain point. Now it's really you taking it to the next place. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the range would be more like 20 to 30K is kind of the sweet spot. We definitely work okay. with brands bigger and definitely help them grow. But that's kind of the main threshold. Once you cross that 20K revenue month uh, a month, Mark, yes. it's usually coming from multiple channels. So it's not just your family and friends buy, buying the products to get you to $20,000 a month. So there's some proof of concept um, cool. from the channels that you're running. You're probably running social ads already. You're probably working with some influencers. You've probably started to dabble in some PR at that point. Yeah. But you're getting all this content back now and that brand owner or that, that freelancer that's working in the agency is not going to have the capacity to, to really test everything properly so that's where someone like us can come in and we can really take them to the next level quickly because we can plug them straight into our systems very cool that's awesome yeah um and it's interesting like usually you're right it's like the owner still trying to run the marketing or maybe it's like an administrative assistant who doesn't really know what they're exactly. doing or you know and even with mar certain marketing agencies they don't have a specialty in this specific e-commerce specifically what you do in the ads and the social um so do you work with other agencies as well where you kind of plug in we do have some white label event? partnerships so yeah, yeah other agencies that are kind of just selling e-com services we'll do the fulfillment for them but to your point like we like to keep our aces in our places we don't dabble in lead gen campaigns we don't do SaaS or apps or promoting games yeah. whilst i'm sure we could and we could probably do a really good job of it it's going to divert our focus away from learning those buckets and kind of really pushing into that content that we sort of built our reputation on. And so we say no to all of that stuff. So it's, it really is purely e-commerce. Yeah. And I would say like, it's so refreshing to hear that because so many businesses try to be everything to everyone. And mm -hmm. I can hear just from how you've gotten clear on your ideal target and like even the services that you're providing, you've had to really learn that lesson of like, no, that's going to cause more problems than it's worth. Yeah. Um, when I was what? first starting, definitely had those moments <laughs> where it was like, oh, someone wants me yeah. to run lead gen for their solar company. It's like, oh, cool. There's a couple thousand dollars there. Like we should just figure this out, but it creates so much more work. And then you end up saying no to like, 10k a month project so it's yeah just stick to what you know yeah that's a great lesson I just wanted to make sure we cemented that one for anyone watching yeah. it is, it's a hard one you know you feel like you should do whatever it takes to take the money but at the same time it's just ultimately not worth it and you're right you miss out on the one that walks by while you're busy doing getting the wrong one exactly. going so yeah. absolutely and speaking of challenges you know what are what are as a business owner because you know we work with a lot of business owners and it's usually one of three categories it's getting their time to more higher wealth activities and getting to the things they really want to do, or it's building a team because they don't have the leverage of depending on others and delegating, or it's, you know, getting profitability to a new level and driving growth. So for you guys, is there a challenge that you're really focused on tackling next? Maybe you're in the crux of it. Like what's the next evolution of the solutions you're looking for to get to the next level? I could honestly say like the last 18 months, like every single problem has been team related. Like it's, it, I noticed that when I was first starting out, it was like, didn't understand like how to sell or how to like close deals. And that was a problem yeah. and then learned those skills. Then it was like, oh, okay, processes. Like we need to make sure people are getting stuff when they get it. Those were all quite easy problems to solve. Now every single problem is like a team problem. It's like this person isn't thinking about these things that they should be thinking about or they these people aren't like cooperating in the way that they need to be. Yeah, it's kind of building the framework so that people can do that. I think that's yeah, definitely the it's, it feels like Groundhog Day constantly where it's like, oh, we've solved this thing. And it's like whack-a-mole, like, oh, another problem pops up over here, which is also related to this team issue. So, yeah. And I think yeah, even on that, like everyone's working remote these days. And mm -hmm. I, I've done that for coming on like 10, 15 years now. I'm quite comfortable with it. And I think people are starting to get more comfortable with it. But there is a massive difference between 
all of us meeting in the office on a Monday morning and having our team meeting versus doing that on Zoom and everyone's in different time zones and we never have any FaceTime. I feel like that's part of the, the challenge as well. It's just navigating all of that. It's yeah, part of the, the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And that's good that you brought that up because it has, you know, some of the businesses that are watching this, like, you know, that pivoting to more hybrid or fully online is newer to them. And so it mm -hmm. does. I mean, with any team, I'll tell you the what you're describing. We kind of joke about the beginning years. What you were talking about is that like the seesaw effect where it's like you close, close stuff and then you got to go deliver it and then you're back to like closing again. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. no, I got to go create more business. But then once you start to grow a team, it's like this chasing your tail because it's, you know, you hire people, but they don't know the answers or they don't know if they're mm -hmm. doing it the way you want it done. And so it's it's this consistent kind of being asked to solve problems and put out fires is another way that they'll describe it. And it's just this yeah. constant firefighting mode. So, um, but that's an exciting place to be because the systems you built for you might not be the systems mm -hmm. that you're, you know, as you expand team need and how do you really learn to be a exactly. manager? That's the new role that, that you take on when you build teams. Feel, it's like, now I, I have to like, be a manager. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like part of the challenge is as the manager, like, well, as, when I was doing it all myself, I'm in the weeds, I'm fixing stuff and I'm like, oh, I see the problem here. I've just got to yeah. do this and then do this, create a process for it. Cool. Managing people though, like for me, I'm, I'm quite removed from the fulfillment side. I, I, I do a lot of the sale, all the sales and mm -hmm. strategy, but I'm not sending things to clients or like, you know, writing scripts or videos. There's other people yeah. that do that. But to manage those teams, it's like, I'm not even in those discussions. So I feel it's a lot like trying to drive the car, but like in the rear vision mirror, like you're driving it forwards, but you're reversing it in the rear vision mirror and trying to navigate those obstacles. That That's, I think, been the biggest learning curve uh, yeah, yeah. for me. Yeah. Well, and that's where you're at is common. And I'm sure others can identify with just still being in like that sales role. That's usually the last thing that owners kind of figure mm -hmm. out how to get out of. Um, but, you know, even having someone else drive management, still realizing you're, you have an owner title too. So if you're not the manager title, someone else is, you still mm -hmm. kind of need to have that regular, you know, communication with your manager because you're still their manager, you know, yeah. so it does kind of take that wearing still hats, even though you've been successful mm -hmm. in getting some, a lot of it off your plate. So congrats to you for figuring that out. But I know you're not alone. That's that's kind of like that next evolution is realizing how do I become this communicator? Because it's different yeah. from what I've had to learn and you've learned sales communication. So you could certainly learn this too. Um, yeah. It's just another level of it, um, but that's a cool place to be. It really is. Cause that's, yeah. you know, where you start really getting this thing humming where your team can function without needing to pull you back in and needing that's to. It, right? kind of, it does yeah. feel like we're on yeah that the verge of like breaking through another level, but it, yeah, there's definitely been a lot of frustration where it's like, Oh, just as an anecdote, like I was going through some of the production stuff we'd been doing for clients because I just hadn't looked in there in, in a little while. And I was like, oh my God, there's literally like 40% of the videos we've made for these clients haven't even made it to the ad account. I just noticed that in sort of part of uh, like a recap I was doing last week. Yeah. I'm like, That's money that we could have spent on lead gen or bonuses or like pizza or anything. And it's like, we're just yeah. hunting this into the black hole to do nothing. And it's, so it's, yeah, like just spotting those things and that stuff that's stopping us from growing that I don't even know about because I'm not in the day-to-day -day there. So yeah, yeah building better yeah. systems and better tracking dashboards. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I just want to like cement what you just said because you know, getting to that place where now you can be an outside perspective is so cool because, but making sure you're doing it. I always um, yeah. talk to business owners about like when they finally get a bookkeeper instead of entering all their own data, mm -hmm. now they actually get to analyze the numbers. They're not so burned yeah. out on like, oh, it's entered. I'm done now. I don't have to look at that again. It's like, no, no, you need to look at it. That's the whole yeah. point. Like I spent <laughs> $6,000 on in. what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So when they, you know, you almost have to remember to go back even to a bookkeeper and use it to now really forecast and what are you doing? So, I mean, that, mm -hmm. I think you're just, even that example is like, it's proving value for you to find time to go back and kind of be an outside perspective to now it's hard for your team or so in it, it's hard for them mm -hmm. to see it. So, and getting some key metrics on those areas, that's another big mm -hmm. one that you're identifying is like, how do we start measuring those bottlenecks so that we would know faster if that was happening again? And that, so that's a really good point too, because I, I think I heard it from a coach or a mentor a while ago where it's like, yeah, you need some sort of uh, like you know, top-down report that's giving you all the main numbers. Yeah. Like 
And what are we doing sales? Where are all the problems? How are the yep. accounts going? Not once have I heard anyone mention anything about like tracking, like how are those certain expenses are being utilized in the account? Yeah. So it wasn't even something like something I thought that we even needed to think about. And then yeah. just going through it and I'm like, because when I do look at that PL, I'm like, oh, okay, 12,000 on production. Like that's the same as it was last month. Probably normal, like whatever, like I got a million other things to do. Right. And I keep looking at the numbers don't change, but then looking in what's actually gone live, we could have spent you know, 40% less and still had the same results. And it's like, yeah. okay. So it's, yeah, I don't even know where I'm going with that story. It's like not yeah. it's like knowing the KPIs that you don't even know that you need to know. Yeah. The only way you can learn them is like through that pain, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and doing what you did, take making sure it's in your calendar to go back and review mm -hmm. critical areas. And, and you know what they are. It's production, which is mm -hmm. always like the salary of your team. So really looking at their effectiveness over time. Mm -hmm. And that's your own time too, obviously. And then looking at, you know, reducing errors and things that make you have to redo production related things. Mm -hmm. So any of those is like, those are your biggest investments. And then marketing is usually another investment area for a company. Mm -hmm. And so how can they really maximize the return, which is what you guys are so good at. So I'm sure, yeah. you know, sometimes the cobbler's kids don't have shoes, but you know, yeah. well, that's you one thing I feel like we're doing well. Like, yeah. All our lead gen channels, because I run them all myself, they're all yeah, humming pretty nicely. So that's yeah, awesome. it's more good yeah, for internal, you, that's not always the challenges there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, cool. That's an exciting place to be. And I guess um, another question I love to, to get from you to help others is like, if you reflect back, like what has been your biggest lesson as a business owner? What's done? It doesn't even have to be recent, but like, what was a pivotal lesson that you've had? Um, I think like never be comfortable being in the same place. Uh, like there's always more things to learn and there's always more yeah. people to learn them from. So yeah, I'm a big fan of like, uh, I'm always taking courses and I'm always trying to look at like what because the business is a whole bunch of areas. There's like the sales and the lead gen and the marketing and then the team management and finance stuff and marketing skills and what's trending on TikTok. Like there's so many different silos. Mm -hmm. I try and yeah, cycle through all of them as much as I can to figure out like what am I weak in um, to keep upskilling because going back to the team, it's, it's really hard to hire the right people or to train the right people if you're also not at least better than average at, at those things too. So that, that's just something I feel like has been part of the learning curve of just Love trying that. to do those reflection moments and see, yeah, what am I struggling with or what can I be better yeah. in? I love that. We actually had a client say, I finally get it. As long as I stay uncomfortable, everything will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> it that's was it. like this realization that uncomfortable is actually a good thing. It means you're growing and you're evolving. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. That's so <laughs> true. It's, yeah. Like the times when it's like, oh, this is going easy. That gives me anxiety because I'm like, oh, <laughs> something bad's about to happen. Like, what do we need to learn? Yeah, like this, reality will come slap me in the face. To in advance something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. And and if you if someone wanted to connect with you, do you have like an introductory offer? Is there um, an informational way to connect with you for like a newsletter or something? Like, tell me a little bit about how that all works. Yeah, work. you can jump on our website, which is dashactivateonline.net, which is our main site. Um, you can reach out there. You can book calls. You can just, yeah. Uh, email form you can sign up to join our newsletter on there we are always sharing your yeah, trending content and stuff that we're making that's one way at the moment we do have an offer that we're running for there's actually two offers it's the same offer but for two different niches so we've got fashion stores and supplement stores um, cool. as long as you're doing at least 20 to 25k a month we have an offer where we'll guarantee to get you to 100 grand a month in 90 days or less all your money back um, i'll have to send through the link for that because i can't remember the yeah. urls for those but there's a couple of landing pages i can send you um, yeah, for those great. two, but yeah, that's a good one. Okay, I'll make sure that those are connected. And what were the two targets for those two? Uh, fa fashion stores and then health okay. supplement stores. Okay, perfect. That's we've awesome. Yeah, I'll make sure the website really and everything is ready to go there. systems for those niches. And so we've been okay. really successful at growing those stores quite quickly if they have the right content, um, which kind of goes back to what I was talking about before. That's why that threshold of 20K is in there. If you're at zero or five grand, you're probably not going to have the pieces. Yeah, we could still probably try and help, but. We are going to be able to guarantee to get you 100 grand. 100 yeah, grand it won't multiply days. as quickly. Yeah, no. that makes total sense. Okay, well, that's a very strong offer. So thank you. Hopefully, yeah. you'll catch somebody watching this and um, that could take advantage of that because if you're really taking away all the risk by doing that, it's awesome. That's it. Yeah, it's totally risk free. Yep.
That's awesome. So tell me, Darian, when you think about what really like gets you up in the morning, what motivates you, like what's your inspiration and passion, like what comes to mind, what really drives you? Uh, I really just like helping people. So it's, I feel like as I learn more about marketing and business, there's just so much value I can share, even just on sales calls, of solving people's problems. I feel like that's really what motivates me uh, yeah, to get up and keep doing what I do because yeah, every day I have calls, every day I'm speaking to new people. It's awesome just being able to like solve that one thing for them or to just show them that whatever they're thinking might be a limiting belief and that there's actually a way oh. to get through that. And here's a whole bunch of examples of you know times we've done that. Just watching them light up and go, oh man, it is possible. Like that, that's a really great feeling. I love that so much. I know I get to do that too. And it is super rewarding to help someone. And it is sometimes I'm sure you experience it, it's kind of like a fear helping them get mm-hmm. past the fear that's really holding them back from yeah, doing definitely. something that seems uncomfortable, but is yeah. really the right thing for them. Yeah. And, but that's it, right? Like that's life. Like mm-hmm. growth is uh, in, uncomfortable. And so, yeah, it's, it's like my job when I'm on the call with them to like help them navigate through that and, and lead them through that fear and pain. Yeah. I really like doing that. That's awesome. So if anybody does reach out to your company and connects with you, they'll actually get to meet with you and and talk to you through their challenges and their company. Very good. So they've already gotten to meet you a little bit and know, you know, your background and everything. That's perfect. Well, I'll make sure everything gets included in the post. And it's been so great learning from you. I think that this is such an interesting kind of niche area where you've really niched yourself down to the right customer and what you offer. And so that you can get these amazing results. I'm telling you, I was really impressed by your website when I looked through it. So you're doing incredible things and thank you we just put up a new case study actually with uh one of our australian brands that we were selling sand free towels and they were struggling going into summer last year which should be the time to sell towels yeah we're now doing 100 150 months in the winter time there now so yeah there's a new case study on on the site that people can check out that's amazing. Yeah, definitely go check out his case studies because they're very, they're awesome. And it really helps to understand what you do as well. So good job for those because not everyone takes the time to do those. They're so powerful when you do awesome. make your case studies clear. So it was such a pleasure getting to know you and definitely stay in touch and reach out to Darian if you've got an e-commerce business and want to get some good insights into what you could do to take it to the next level. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. See you soon. Cool. Thanks. Bye.